you please welcome Mark O'Connor. So we've got, a, we, we've got a little microphone right there for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I get mine on a stand because I can't multitask. <laughs> so I have, to, I have to be able to do a few things here. So, um, and, I mean, the intro alone is mind-boggling enough. Um, and, and given the range of your musical instruments, tell me a little bit about the kinds of music you were just hearing around the house when you were growing up. Well, obviously a, a lot of different kinds. Um, and um, my, my first instrument was guitar. My folks were ballroom dance teachers. And uh, my mom loved flamenco music as well as classical. And so you could see already a real eclectic beginning to my studies. Yeah. And um, I, I became fairly proficient as a classical and flamenco guitarist even before I picked up the violin. And, um, but when I picked up that fiddle, it was the hoedowns and ragtime, the, the waltzes and the improvisation and the blues and uh, the African-American spirituals and all that stuff that just really moved my heart. And um, it set me on uh, the path to uh, be a creative musician. Yeah. Um, before we get to the, to the violin, I mean, you were extraordinarily prof proficient on guitar. And I'm wondering, was there a particular artist or even a song that said, geez, I want to play guitar. Mm -hmm. Well, my, I loved um, Segovia. My mom did and, as well. And then uh, we loved Manitas de Platas, the great flamenco guitarist. And then, uh, then we started getting into bluegrass. Um, but you know, but even before that, though, it was Johnny Cash. I, we, we loved Johnny <laughs> Cash. <laughs> I love 19, that. 1969 uh, ABC uh -huh. television show. Um, do you recall the, the first three guests he had on the first episode? Well, I know Dylan was on. Dylan, yeah, that yeah. was yep. one, yeah, which was amazing. Yeah, right? I mean that, I mean, that that alone stopped right <laughs> there. We're good. Yeah, yeah. Joni Mitchell. Oh man, is right. that amazing? Yeah, incredible. One of my favorite musicians ever. Yeah. And then the guy who inspired me to want to pick up the fiddle was also on that first episode, the Raging Cajun Doug Kershaw. Doug Kershaw. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> what a great think, think about that. Hour that would television. never happen on network television now. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. So it inspired me to do what I do really and and um I grew up in Seattle, Washington, so mm -hmm. it wasn't at that point it wasn't really a, a musical mecca yeah. like it maybe has um, turned into since I left. Um and um, you know went to other places. Um but uh, we did have Hendrix uh, the legacy of the Hendrix there. <laughs> that's right. Uh, that's what everybody talked about the most, yeah. and I love I love yeah. Jimi Hendrix. Um, but yeah, then we started getting into bluegrass. Um, loved Clarence White and mm -hmm. Doc Watson mm -hmm. and Tony Rice. And and it, and at sixteen, y you recorded you know a record of guitar music. And and by the way, I actually wrote this down. Um, the great title of the record. The record was called Markology. Yeah, I'd, I'd love that. I know David Grisman named it. Yeah, uh, he did. Yeah, yeah. That's me. That's me. Because you had Grisman on it, Sam Bush, Dan Crary, Tony Rice. Yeah. At sixteen. Yeah. And I, I was, uh, I mean, extremely fortunate. It was. I, I remember when um, that all came down. I was uh, fifteen at the time these decisions were made, and I was going through a, a very hard year because I had lost my wonderful teacher, Benny Thomason, to, he went back to Texas. Mm -hmm. He was living up there in Seattle, Washington for a while, and he was teaching me all about the Texas fiddle breakdowns, mm -hmm. and that really inspired me. And um, he was so creative, creative genius. And then he went back to Texas, and, and I didn't really have a replacement for him up there. And I was at a very vulnerable stage in my career, uh, in my um, um, development as a student. At 15 years old, I mean, where do you go next? I really did need a teacher at that point, but I became self-taught, and I, I, I had a lot of um, some depression as a hmm. mid-teen could have, and I, at some point, I just started, you know, not being interested in practicing anymore, and um, 
it was Rounder Records that came up with this idea. If we can, Mark, if we can get Tony Rice <laughs> to play with you, um, would you do an album for us? Because I was like, I, I didn't even want to do an album huh. or anything. Um, and that really inspired me. So yeah. that was a crucial point for me. Yeah. You, you said that, um, um, I'm, I'm wondering, the, the, the first time you actually heard the violin, because you know, you've talked about how moving it was to you, did, you know, kind of describe that moment when it was like, that's what I really want to do. Yeah, well, Doug Kershaw, Doug Kershaw he had such an incredible, joyous sound. I couldn't believe how happy music could be. And then I heard Vassar Clements, who played that bluesy style, and the depth of emotion that he had within his uh, voice through that violin uh, just moved me as well. So I love blues. Um, right from the very beginning, I was a you know, little kid that played blues all the time on the fiddle. Matter of fact, I, my first fiddle contest I entered, I would play blues for my third tune. I didn't know that that probably was not going to win me a lot of old-time fiddle contests yeah. at the time. But, you know, that's how I started. Yeah. And, uh, and I remember some of the old uh, folks coming up to my mom going, how, how did that young boy of yours get the, get the blues music like that, you know? <laughs> but I, I, it really moved me, and, and it's, it's a very, m very much a staple yeah. of my music today. I, you know, I, I, I said in the open that, that you had this remarkable experience where you won consecutive stringed instrument contests on a number of different instruments, ultimately the fiddle. And I think, it's, I think you won that four times in a row, and they said, thanks, Mark, enough. <laughs> you know, really. Um, uh, and, but the, the, the question really is, how did that kind of, uh, I would imagine, intense preparation prepare you for the rest of your career? You know, it was, it was very, it was something that, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of places for an American string player to play uh, underage. You know, like back then, you know, if you, you couldn't get into the clubs to play, so where are you going to play? For me, it was those contests. And um, winning really was um, not that important to, to me. I, I just wanted to jam. You know, I wanted to... Uh, matter of fact, I actually l liked losing sometimes because Why? when I won, nobody would jam with me after the end. Like, they were all snot, you know, well, you know. Um, they were all mad at me <laughs> for, for beating them. Um, but I wanted to jam with those older players that yeah. I was beating in the fiddle contest yeah. because, I, because they had the musical language and I just wanted to be around it. It, it just gave me so much inspiration. Mm. Um, I was definitely um, a good contest player, but I, I actually didn't mind getting second or third um, because the jam sessions were even sweeter after huh. the that's great. Contest, you know? That's great. You 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 mentioned him briefly, but you've talked often about Benny Thomason and not only what what he meant to you. He was he was a Texas fiddler, and that's a particular style. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that and what he meant to you in your career. Well, he, he and this was really the beginning of my compositional uh, process. He was a, a great theme and variations. Guy and he would take he was able to take a theme and develop it in our American vernacular and um, you know very similar to our improvisatory music um, but with Benny Thomas and it was like he worked on it as a as if he was a classical composer I mean he would he would he would fine tune the variations over and over like a almost like a Beethoven uh, mm. effort um, go over and over again and, and perfect these gems and he would you end up usually making the tunes better than they were. Um, and those are the pieces that I learned. And then a lot of my lessons, matter of fact, we might play um, a couple things that uh, he taught me. To, but so, some of the renditions that I continue to play today were from my lessons where he encouraged me to do the same thing. And he said, you know, come back and bring your own variation of this the theme um, and we'll see how it goes. And, and, and if it wasn't quite up to snuff, and he would help me with it. And then the lesson result would be a rendition that a lot of people would end up playing out there. Um, so contrast that with, because a little later in your career, you got to work with the great French jazz violinist Stefan Grappelli. So tell us about the difference in terms of working with, with him. Yes, it was, uh, um, Stefan was the, the genius improviser. Um, he wasn't as much of a composer or a ranger alike, um, like Benny. So I got the other side of, 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 of the Americana uh, from Stefan. He really my finishing teacher, he had it all. You know, he was, 
matter of fact, he he really inspired me to have a, uh, to to ha want to have a career as a soloist. Um, he had such a big voice in in music, uh, a huge personality. He had so much to say to a big audience. I mean, gosh, you know, he pretty much took jazz violin and put it on his back and carried it. You know, carried it for decades. Um, and now that he's gone, you know, I mean, we're sorely missing him. Mm. Um, but uh, jazz violin has been one of those kind of f funny um, industries. And, you know, it's like the very few people can excel at it and have a, as little and have a career in it. But I think it's still something that um, could really c rise above. Um, and um, it, because jazz is, you know, I mean, jazz and ragtime, it was, you know, it was born on the violin just like it was those brass instruments. Now, you know, starting from the 1800s. So um, it's naturally suited for the yeah. violin, the fiddle. You, um, you recorded, I think, four albums of fiddle music, I think before you got out of high school or, or very much around then. But you determined that you wanted to get beyond that. You know, you went out to play with Grappelli and, and the Dixie Dregs. Um, um, what, what was it that was driving, because, you know, I suppose you could have had a very nice sort of comfortable thing doing, you know, kind of standard, the standard fiddle tune repertoire forever. Um, what drove you to get beyond that? Yeah, it's, um, it probably, you know, is one of those things where I think, um, boredom would probably be my biggest enemy. Uh -huh. And I was so good, um, at fiddling so young that, um, and, and a lot of the fiddlers were, were wanting to hold me back. I mean, you know, they, they saw me get very, very fairly progressive within the style, and, uh, and I like doing that, but it wasn't everybody's favorite thing. And so I thought, well, I need to leave fiddling and go, actually go into jazz. What, was there really marketing. pushback from kind of the traditional fiddle yeah. community? Yeah, there still is, you know, like, Interesting. I'm always like a, kind of a rebel, you know, among, amongst the traditionalists. Huh. Um, but I love the, tr but the funny thing is I love traditional music. Right. I just, I just like to be, a, I'm also a progressive as well. Yeah. So, so it was, uh, I didn't want to, you know, play that game so early in my musical development. Hmm. And I, I just wanted to make sure that I had uh, opportunities to explore my own creativity. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't want to play the game of being held back by the traditionalists. Like that wasn't something that, I wanted to get into uh, too deep. Yeah, there's a, an, another gentleman who was, in, you know, very important. I think um, in your career, Chet Atkins. Tell it. Tell us how you met Chet. He uh, he heard my that Markology album, mm. and uh, honest to goodness, he wrote me a, like a fan letter. Huh. Um, I hope you saved that. I, I know it's in my scrapbook, um, but what an amazing thing! But um, at that time. Um, I was in the, when I, by the time he wrote it, I was already in the Drake, so it was sort of two or three years after that album uh -huh. came out, and uh, he had just discovered it, and I was, I didn't think I liked country music at that time, so he was saying, you know, you should come up and visit me, come up to Nashville, and, uh, and so um, when the, 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 the Dixie Drakes broke up when I was 19, that's when I actually took him up on his offer and visited Nashville and went to uh, to his office right there on Music Row, and I was 22 at the time, and uh, and uh, he said, "Well, Mark, uh, what do you want to do in music?" And I go, "I gee, I don't know. I record, um, record more," and 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 then I said, "Or be on television?" <laughs> I don't know. Like it was it was a very clumsy answer. I just didn't really know. What I was, it was very uh, humbling, kind of being around one of the legends, you know. And um, he said, be on television, huh? I, 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 yeah, I guess so. I, 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 don't, I, I was sort of speaking out of turn. He goes, I think I can arrange it for you to get on a, a television show. And, and so he picked up the phone. He called uh, the Nashville Now, Ralph Emery. Yeah, sure. And I got a young man here, and I want to put him, you know, have you put him on? And then and I sort of, is, uh, are you busy in about two weeks? And I go, no. <laughs> Uh, and then I had the insight to say, will you play with me? So that started an amazing mentoring um, uh, relationship with mm -hmm. Chet. 
And those two pieces that we played are on YouTube. You can uh, search those. So thank goodness I had the you know, foresight to say, will you play with me? Yeah. Because he was just going to introduce me and sit on the couch. Right. And I went, oh, man, this is a great opportunity. So that was one of my bigger moves. Sure. But I you, you, spent, you spent a fair, a fair amount of time with, with Chet. Um, um, and and I've, I've read interviews with you where you've talked about um, kind of hanging out in Chet's office. Yeah where you actually got to hear him play things that, you know, most of us who kind of know Chet Atkins, mm -hmm. the public Chet Atkins, would, yeah. would never have got to hear. Talk a little bit about just hanging with Chet. It was, it was very wild because of our, the guitar was our connection, and mm -hmm. I didn't really uh, completely understand that until I was um, really set on becoming a session player on the fiddle. And I was thinking well, that maybe Chet could um, help me but he really wasn't there to help me on the fiddle. Like he, he, and he would even doubted um, that there would be any need for the fiddle on country music. And I was um, kind of, my mind was spinning. I was going, so he's so supportive of me on my guitar, but when it comes to fiddling, maybe no. And then I was talking to another legendary fiddler um, around that same time period, Buddy Spiker, who played on many albums um, in the 60s and 70s, including Hank Williams and Patsy Cline, and he was also a hero. And I mentioned that I'd been uh, getting together with Chet regularly, like he would take me out to lunch once a week, and then Buddy says, uh, well, he's no, he's no friend of the fiddle. Huh. And I, Whoa, really? And so I couldn't wait to, for our next lunch appointment and kind of ask Chet gingerly about yeah. what he thought about fiddling. He says, well, you know, I was one of the people that took it out of country music. And uh, he, he introduced the sound, the, what they called the Nashville sound, right. which was string sections. String, yeah, string sections, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. And, uh, and it replaced the fiddle. And so if I was going to be um, a session fiddler, which, um, you know, I was, I was in the wrong era to show up in Nashville. It was in the early 1980s. Um, it was going to be a hard row. Yeah. And, uh, but he told me, he said, you know, if it could be reintroduced, you could do it. Hmm. And uh, so he gave me that, uh, you know, that little seed of inspiration, hmm. and I, I, somehow I figured out how to do it. Yeah. He was, you know, obviously Chet was, you know, frankly, larger than life in, you know, in many respects in terms of his impact on country music and the Nashville music community. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if you have, you know, kind of one lasting memory of him. You know, he, um, I, I moved away from Nashville because it just got to be such a rat race there for me, and I really wanted to concentrate, concentrate on other things, including writing my concertos mm -hmm. and symphonies and string quartets, and I was constantly inundated with people calling me, wanting me to play on their album, so it was really hard for me to concentrate and get into a, you know, another line of thinking, and I, so I moved out of town, moved actually to Southern California, for a while, and so several years went by, and um, out of the blue, I got a call from Chet. Um, ran to get the phone, and and uh, he said, "I just wanted to call you to tell tell you, Mark, that I, I love you." And uh, hmm. it was I, I, Chet, I love you too. And he was kind of making the rounds and calling a lot of friends, I think. And he died just a few months later. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Well, um, you, you've had, you know, a, a remarkable series of mentors, whether it was Benny Thomason or Stefan Grappelli, um, Chet Atkins. And, and I'm wondering, talk a little bit about the importance for, you know, really any, any young musician to have a, a musical mentor. Yeah, I think it's a, a really a, a, a very big deal. Uh, you know, teachers... Um, um, offer um, you know often um, fit that role nicely, but there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of people that don't get great teachers too, and those but those students could also become very good musicians, and so I think it's um, it, I think I mean what you're doing here with the, the Grammy Museum and what a lot of the professional musicians are doing now, um, reaching out and doing a lot of outreach and education is so important for a lot of people out there um, that need inspiration 
um, and that, that spark to keep mm -hmm. them driving uh, and pushing their own um, you know talent limits uh, to the top. And um, you know I had that um, firsthand, and so I was very very lucky. Um, but you know that's one of the reasons why I started my own fiddle camps and string camps, so I could uh, you know put myself and some of my colleagues right in front of a, a, a you know over 20 years now, thousands, 7,000 unique enrollments in my camps, uh, summer camps to date, hmm. um, which um, you know, constitutes the, the largest um, you know, string learning environment, um, you know, surpassing things, you know, places like Aspen and Tanglewood. Um, there's that much interest out there, but it still has not really been terribly formalized. You know, they'll, they'll come to my camp in the summer or other ones like it now, but they'll return home and, and go, you know, back to the same old stuff. And, and uh, it's hard to find American string playing in, uh, in the public schools uh, or the private schools or the universities and conservatories. Still, um, I do um, my share of, of master classes and presentations, um, but it's a huge wall to knock down. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the string playing historically um, has left out American music um, in our educational hmm. uh, sphere, and so I'm trying to do something about that. Yeah, you you recorded a, a, a record called False Dawn, which would you know, kind of the it was kind of an early indication, I think, of of the direction you you would ultimately take. Why was that record important for you? I felt like I wanted to make a statement that. Um, that, uh, you know, in, in the search of my own voice, um, I was also being a rebel. I was rebelling against status quo. Um, like, for instance, in the False Dawn, sort of, it's like a, an insight into my future classical mm -hmm. writing. Um, it was all through composed music that I was doing on all these folk instruments. And, you know, way kind of ahead of its time, you know, that, that album, you know, in, uh, influenced people like Edgar Meyer and Bela Fleck. Um, and I did it when I was a teenager. And, um, and for instance, um, there's very little strumming of the guitar. And I was like constantly cross-picking and doing counterpoint lines um, with the flat pick. That's one of the things that I um, got so tired of doing with, uh, uh, with the, the being a rhythm guitarist, you know, with, with David Grisman, for instance, is you know, being the rhythm player. I wanted the guitar to, to provide a, an, an interesting new kind of counterpoint mm -hmm in the bluegrass and, and folk music circles. Hmm. Um, you, you also undertook something that at the time was somewhat unusual, the, the solo violin concerts. Uh, talk a little bit about, uh, number, number one, what the inspiration was to do that, um, and you know, kind of the, the reception to it. Well, uh, you know, one of the hardships for me with, uh, it's much easier for me to have a career now because I can, I can do my hot swing gig, you know, <laughs> one week, and then I can play the orchestra the next week, and I can, I can play a bluegrass gig with my family band the next week, and um, that is becoming more and more um, um, a beautiful thing. Hmm. But in the 70s and 80s, people were so compartmentalized, and uh, the marketing of music was so. Um, so, so category driven, genre driven, and a lot of people were, were saying, you know, you can't play two different things and be taken seriously. Um, so I had all these influences. I had all the influences ranging from blues and and world music, and my teachers Stefan and Benny, and they were completely worlds apart as well. And so I thought that a solo violin performance would be the way that I could attract audiences to, to what I was doing and bring them into my music. Um, as soon as you put a group or a band uh, uh, that represents a specific genre, then it's pigeonholed. Hmm. Where like um, if I you know erased the background instruments and created solo violin repertoire, um, I could do a lot of my passages that I would typically play over a bluegrass improvisation and to a classical audience, that would sound like a, a new kind of um, violin music uh, that, um, that they could perhaps wrap their head around. Hmm. Um, and so um, that, was the, that was the concept, is to, is to diversify 
um, just on the solo instrument and then build the audience and, and get people um, uh, tuned into what you were doing um, and then then expand it. Yeah. You, you, um, you wrote um, the Fiddle Concerto n n number one and about that, and uh, I, I, I actually wrote this down because this is a great quote. Um, my idea was to create American rhythms and space with hyper-technical, virtuosic writing. Tell me what you mean by that. Well, a lot of people were recognizing that I, I, I was, um, I was um, technically proficient on my instrument, and that wasn't something that, was, you know, that a lot of people were used to seeing in the bluegrass world or, you know, um, especially, you know, Nashville. And I remember you mentioned John Harford in the mm -hmm. intro when I was when I was uh, putting together my solo show. He was a love that guy by the wonder, way. I know wonderful solo artist. Yeah, and um, talk about multi genre. You know, like he, he was able to do it with his banjo and voice right. and songwriting. And so I was trying to do something similar, maybe to him, but on the violin. And I, I, I played him some of my stuff, including these caprices that were kind of blindingly virtuosic. I go, do you think that I could hold an audience with that stuff? I mean, you know, are they going to just tune it out? He goes, they're going to, their eyes are going to be glued to your bow arm and to the way you play and your presence and, and the music is going to just, you know, blow them away. He gave me the inspiration to that it could really work. And that's, uh, that's what gave me the, the courage to leave, basically leave Nashville, leave Sessions. Mm -hmm and go from a sideman who I was very celebrated. It's, it's hard to leave <laughs> um, a scene where you know they're awarding you, um, uh, but you still are not fulfilled musically. Yeah. And, um, and I was ready to you know, gamble everything. I, you know, I had a house, I was willing to lose it. I had all these instruments, I was willing to lose them. Take it all the way down to the basics again hmm. um, so I could find the artist that was in me. Yeah, and 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 I mean, you were busy. You 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 had an ongoing career. You won CMA awards, all kinds all kinds of stuff in Nashville. So you definitely did take a risk mm -hmm. to you know to 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 go and do that. I I, I want to talk about I, I I think a record that kind of flipped the script for you a little bit, and that's Appalachia Waltz. Um, you know, with Yo-Yo Ma and yeah. Edgar Meyer. First of all, tell me how you met those guys. Well, um, Edgar and I ended up moving to Nashville about the same time, and we met just in the circles, you mm -hmm. know, through through uh, mutual um, acquaintances like Bela Fleck, um, and uh, we just started hanging out and you know showing up at the same house parties and jams, <laughs> and then we started playing together. Um, eventually, we formed Strength in Numbers. Yeah. Um, uh, very, you know, within a few years, and um, that's like a seminal you know, mm -hmm. group. Um, and um, and then we had this crazy idea, Edgar and me, <laughs> to write Yo-Yo Ma, and tell him that we are writing some American string music, and um, if he's interested, we would love to share that with him and show it to him. And uh, by the ch you know it, by the uh, slight chance that he might be uh, willing to to look at it and play with it, uh, play with us. So he um, responded very positively to the first letter, and um, he had his uh, assistant call. So he actually came down to Nashville and over to my house. Huh. So Yo Yo Ma, wow, in my kitchen for uh, two or three hours. We didn't even. Uh, Touch the instruments. Yeah, we we're just talking about American string playing. He had no idea what this was. Like you know, he he knew uh, about us a little bit because you know we were making a name for ourselves. Um, but you know, other than hearing a few things here and there, he, he didn't know if there was a tradition of this or where this was coming from. So it's this monumental point in my life where I was educating. Um, uh, the, probably the greatest string player of our time about American string music and, and string playing. And I was t trying to tell him that it was important. He said, 
why is it important? Like, you know, because yo yo ma wants to do important things. You know, like, yeah. he yeah. doesn't want to. Yeah. If it's not, not gonna, important, not why not going to be hanging around your house? Right. You know, playing a bar mitzvah. Yeah. Why is this important? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh. Um, and so I, I had, I was, you know, I was uh, uh, assumed the role um, of, um, um, you know, educating uh, one of the greats on American string playing. Um, and it was in a fascinating two or three hours. And hmm. then right after that conversation, we went to the living room and I showed him, uh, Edgar wasn't there yet. Um, he, was, he came later that day and I showed him Appalachian Waltz. And uh, boy, I, I just saw in his face this, the whole world open up and I knew that there was something going to happen. You know, there was nothing scheduled, nothing like a recording or even dates. And, um, but it was Appalachian Waltz that, hmm. that got his attention and then that opened the doors to the project. Did he just take to, take to it in a way? Did he sort of um, you know, just understand in some sense what you were trying to, trying to do musically? It was, it was an amazing journey that we, we took because um, um, you know, I, was, I was also learning how to play with him. Um, I had to, I had to uh, kind of reinvent my sound and my, my ability to, to uh, match tones with him and uh, vibrate in, in a very strong, robust way. When he went there, I had to find it in myself to go there with him I was, you know, also trying to bring him to my style as well. But you know, ultimately, this project was going to work if we um, had a compromise. You know, mm -hmm. we, we met mm -hmm. each other fifty yeah. percent uh, halfway. You know, like if he was going to just completely forget about everything Yo Yo is to do this music, then um, it, it, I don't, I didn't think it was going to work very well. So we had to really invent a third thing, and which, which was, thank, thank goodness. Uh, Sony Classical labeled it American classical music. I never really thought about a term for it, but we were definitely embarking on a new tradition that had been um, around for a while, but not really um, fully realized. You know, Gershwin, Copeland, you know, Dvorak even. I mean, he, he, he wanted us to have an American classical music, and he contributed himself to that um, um, with his own perspective. Um, but you know, not a lot of our composers got the great message of that, um, and we went into modernism and and things that, that sounded exactly like if you know you lived in New York or you could live in London. There mm. was almost no difference. There was there was uh, there was a, not a music in classical music that was based from our culture, like Bartok mm. and Kodai did in you know in Hungary, uh, or Piazzolla did in Argentina, and there's many examples. All the Russian composers and so forth. And so this was a real opportunity to have um, the, uh, the greatest classical string player fully immersed in this effort uh, that we were writing. And we just, you know, we're writing all kinds of music and, and we'll, we'll play a couple pieces yeah. of, from that yeah. project. Um, so. Tell me, because, I mean, the reception was remarkable, Grammy Award, all, you know, all, all, the, all the recognition you know, that, it, that it deserved. And I'm wondering for you, it, it, what doors did that open for you? Well, it was one of those things that, you know, if that project failed, I, I, I mean, luckily it succeeded greatly. Um, Yo-Yo's album that he had released right before Appalachian Waltz was a big heavy hitter for uh, chamber music. He recorded with uh, the he recorded the Trout Quintet with Isaac Stern and uh, Emmanuel Axe and Jamie Laredo, and Edgar Meyer was on the bass on that. So it was a five piece. That was in 1994. And it sold, you know, sort of a typical of a Yo-Yo Ma album at that point, about 50,000. And so when it came to do our trio album together, you know, I think I was hoping that, man, it would be incredible if we could get to those numbers, the mm -hmm. 50,000 number for classical recording. That would be great because, you know, it's a, more of a limited audience than what I was doing with, uh, in Nashville with my new Nashville Cats. It had sold in the hundreds of thousands. Mm -hmm. Um, cl close to half a million. And so, unbelievably, it just shot up, you know, like it, it entered the charts and stayed up there for a year uh, on the number one position. It ended up selling a half a million um, copies. And then the, the second one did the same thing. 
Um, so I think for me, if it, if it would have just fell on its face and, uh, and failed, um, I would have taken the biggest hit because mm. the, the whole album was really designed around my perspective. Uh, fiddling, what does fiddling mean to uh, classical music and the improvisatory nature of the music. And it was really based on my American style. And um, the fact that um, it did so well, you know, basically gave me a, a career yeah. in classical music. You, um, and, and I, I wanna get to a couple things before we, uh, before we get to some music. Um, and speaking of, you know, kind of the, the improvised nature of this, you went on to write an improvised violin concerto, yeah. which, if you think about this, is mind-bending in that you wrote an orchestral piece and left open, you know, an entire section for an improvised violin part. Yeah. Um, uh, and 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 I, I just want I, I just want to read because there are basic principles that you wrote in terms of how this is to be constructed, and this is fascinating. A large, perfectly synchronized body of musicians, a violin part that must be completely improvised, and the orchestra must introduce and develop themes to provide the form and logic for the piece. Yep. Now that's incredibly easy to say. <laughs> how difficult is that to actually execute? Well, I, I've been th I'd been thinking about it for quite some time in the, the, the very first concerto where I wrote. The fiddle concerto was kind of mind-bending in a way because I was, it was the first violin concerto that introduced not only uh, American fiddling um, as, it, as the centerpiece um, for its um, musical language. Um, um, and a lot of classical music had introduced thematic language but I was trying to introduce technical language as well as stylistic and rhythmic language and um, on the solo part. And so that's, that was kind of a groundbreaking piece for me. Then I, uh, then I composed uh, a series of other concertos that loosely followed the kind of same theme. And then I got to a, a point uh, a couple years ago where I was looking at the daunting uh, task of maybe one more concerto it was, com it was commissioned by the Boston Youth uh, Symphony uh, for Boston Hall. And I was thinking, uh, and it was my, gonna be my ninth concerto, which has a, a great ring to it um, in uh, the history of classical writing for symphonies. I thought, well, maybe this might be my final hurrah. Could I think of something that was as boldly new as that first fiddle concerto? And I was thinking about this improvised concerto, an improvisation, I had begun, I had started to release my method materials and improvisation was a, 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 was a, um, a phrase that I kept repeating uh, to educators, you know, like why, why can't our violin students improvise a little bit? Um, they, need to, they need to have some of that training as well as the, the finger and bow training. Mm -hmm. and, and then just to put, you know, uh, put a right in, in the center of the, of, of my environment, I came up with a improvised violin concerto, which is perhaps the first, very first violin concerto in history that pr is, might be unplayable for most Juilliard graduates. Hmm. So like, you know, here's a piece of classical music that requires the, the violinist to do this and they might not be able to, <laughs> which is fascinating yeah. concept. Yeah. And it sort of like puts out my educational message that, you know, um, you know, if we had American styles and improvisation mm -hmm. in uh, the training, um, along with you know technical accuracy and, and good bowing and good pitch and good tone, then there'd be a lot of players that yeah. could approach a piece like that and not just play mine, but even write their own. Yeah. So, so this is the perfect segue to um, you have talked often about the importance of reinvigorating string music instruction um, in this country. Um, elaborate on, on what, you were, what you were just getting at and what you are getting at with the O'Connor method. Well, I decided to, to release a method. Um, I'd been working on it for years and it really stemmed out of my fiddle camps and string camps 
And it was very, there was an, a, an aspect of them that was uh, very frustrating for me. And it usually, with these little kids <laughs> coming in from the classical scene, who were just lost, completely lost at these camps, and they weren't having a, you know, everything was just difficult for them and the parents. And at some point I got so frustrated with it, I, I uh, didn't allow any children under 10 to come to my fiddle camps for a few years. Really? Wow. Yeah, just because yeah. I was so bummed out that they were bummed out. Mm. And I couldn't figure out, how could you come to this place and not have a good time? Yeah. You know, like everybody's having a great time. All these little fiddle kids were running around and jamming and playing Arkansas Traveler and really tearing it up. And then you had all these jazzers and, and the people that are into rock. And, and, and then you had a lot of the hybrid players, people that could play fiddling and classical music. And everybody was developing a community, but there was this segment of small kids, um, you know, usually under the age of 11, um, they just weren't getting it. I found out that m the vast majority of these students were uh, Suzuki students. And um, like by the thousands. Um, remember, I had 7,000 um, unique enrollments in mm. my camps. So a couple thousand of them at easy, probably more, were Suzuki students. And so I started to look at their materials um, more um, uh, completely. And um, I was inspired to create a new violin method that was more relevant to our culture um, that um, didn't leave out American playing, um, American music, um, and creativity, and improvisation, and proper ear training. Um, I, I, I came to learn that the Suzuki ear training is about memorization and repeating something over and over again until you memorize it. And like, you know, I mean, you and I have to memorize things as adult professionals, but I mean, we don't really need to memorize every single tune when we're seven years old. I mean, I, actually, I would prefer children to revisit tunes and change them a little bit hmm. and add something. You know, if they develop, go back to the tune. That's what I did. I mean, I learned Burlum Cabbage Down when I, the very first tune. And then when I got a little better, I revisited Burlum Cabbage Down and made it better and made it more complicated. And then I got even better. I went back and made it. it like It was a creative process. I was a real musician, a real artist. And um, so I wanted to bring that, um, that, that beautiful uh, um, imagination of learning and becoming an artist to young children. And now the O'Connor Method really starts at the very beginning, you know, three, four, five years old. And they're learning to play Boil em Cabbage Down, Amazing Grace, Old Joe Clark, all these really cool tunes, play with rhythm um, and great sound and good intonation uh, and creative music materials. And um, so uh, I've taken it all the way up to the advanced levels. And uh, my newest release with my wife, Maggie, um, is the duos. Um, I, have, I, have it here. I have it here. The violin duos are part of the method. They start from the very beginning because I, I want to encourage teachers to actually play with the student. Out Not, next week. <laughs> yes, that's it. Look for um, us. We are really, really excited about this. It's just... Uh, and all this music is just so beautiful. Even at the beginning levels, it's all professional music, really good quality music. A lot of the, the students that I was seeing at my camps, they were, you know, they had to play these etudes and scales and over and over. And, and like they were just draining every little yeah. uh, I mean, that, that, creativity. That, that's kind of part, of part of your point with this is finding a way in to string music in a way that is inviting and not necessarily academic. Yes, I mean, I think that um, by the time, you know, a lot of scale studies comes in handy, um, you're a little bit older, you know, mm -hmm. say yeah. 10, 11, 12, 13, where you can really handle um, real exhaustive, you know, drills. Mm -hmm. But when, when you're a little young child, I think it's learning is should be more about joy and fun and and all these wonderful things, creativity and, and play some uh, tunes and play some tunes, rhythm, even just rhythm alone is creative. Just hmm. following each hmm. other's rhythm around. Yeah. I mean, that's a creative endeavor. It's yeah. not just an academic one. It's not just counting beats in a measure. You can feel something with hmm. your music. And we, and we think that children have been denied this in the, in the string playing. And it shows we have very, very few creative classical violinists of our time. Um, very like 
I mean, it used to be in the 17 and 1800s when they learned a different way, those guys were composers. They, you know, uh, up through Fritz Kreisler and even Heifetz was composing pieces and he did the adaptations of Gershwin and, you know, and, and um, but the, the modern era of string uh, playing in the classical scene, we don't really have top classical violinists that have composed anything mm -hmm. or um, can improvise and, um, and it, our, the, the violin is, I think, is suffering because of that. Um, we got to make it more relevant to our culture and our time. How, how, many, how many books now have you done? We're just releasing uh, book five, which is now at the wow. very advanced level. And then six through ten will be coming with basically just repertoire. But if you can get up through our five, uh, book five, yeah. you're playing really yeah. well. Yeah. And, uh, and you're ready for you know, university and, and, and conservatories. That's, that's fantastic. Well, um, you know, as I said to you upstairs, we've been trying to arrange this with you for, I think, two or three years to get you here. So oh. we are so deeply grateful that you took the time to come and, and chat. Um, um, but more importantly, we want to hear you play. Okay. Um, uh, so the record, yes. The record is called Duo. Um, it is out next week. Uh, look for that in all the places you would normally be looking um, for CDs and music. But more importantly, would you please welcome Mark O'Connor. Thank you. Thank you.